Hey, good day, beautiful people. Greet you in a wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we praise Him, we thank Him, we honor Him for what He is doing, how He is working. And we continue and we try to understand from a prophetic point of view and from an intercessory point of view. So prophetic intercessory point of view. Studying the book Isaiah, and we are at chapter 20. So we're going to do this Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, for a while. Because we know there's a lot of chapters um, but it's fun and we we try to see how do we apply what we read in these old books um, and how to apply it in our day-to-day -day life as born-again Christians and how do we intercede and pray from a prophetic point of view understanding what the difference is between prophetic and speaking the Word of God there's differences like we mentioned so today we studying Isaiah 20 and we um, I'm going to focus our attention on verse 2 and verse 3 um, at the same time spake the Lord by Isaiah the son of Amos saying go and loose the sackcloth from off from off thy loins and put off thy shoe from thy foot and he did so walking naked and barefoot and we know that a lot of prophets said weird things back in those days if we read the Bible and sometimes if we see that nowadays how would you react to a prophet doing that the same thing and the Lord said like as my servant Isaiah hath walked naked and barefoot three years for a sign and wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia Cush so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians prisoners and the Ethiopians captive young and old, naked and barefoot, even with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. And that's a prophecy. And yesterday we said, actually, God, there's a triangle between Assyria, Cush and Israel. So how does this apply? So God is working here on something. Um, so where can we place our trust? And some trust, some of us trust in money, others in people, and the other have the safe space. Um, Judah relied on seemingly stable, indestructible nations like Egypt and Ethiopia, Cush. However, these nations failed to protect them against the Assyrian attacks. So when facing challenges, where can we take refuge? And what should we do in the face of threatening situations? And we see what's going on. So for people nowadays going through threatening situations, either physical or spiritual, and the prophet Isaiah walked almost, well, he actually walked naked. So there's a bit of a um, discussion on was he really naked or almost naked. But nonetheless, it was embarrassing. The prophet Isaiah walked naked and barefoot for three years, showing the hum humiliation that the world uh, politically, well, that the world politically powers would face. We can read that verse one to five. And when even the great world powers fail, he shall how shall we escape if we see what's going on if the political powers in nowadays fail how are we going to escape what are we going to do verse 6 Jesus humbled himself even more than Isaiah in order to save the Jews and to save us and he became a man lived among us for three years and a half died on a cross devoid of clothing and provided our only way of escape if the Jews had paid attention to Isaiah's message, they would have been safe. And we too will be saved if we hear the message of the God who humbled himself. I want to go back to Philippians 2 verse 5 to 11 um, and focus on that. So let this be in your in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and was took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, and that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, 
to the glory of God our Father. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation. What does this mean for us now? Um, so if you look at verse 4 to 5 in Philippians 2, the true obstacle to unity of heart um, and mind is not based on differences of opinion, but is due to self uh, selfishness and vanity. And we talked about vanity as well in previous videos, Lucifer. Shifting attention away from oneself to others, which of course is what Jesus Christ did as well. And it is the key to Christian unity. The fact that Paul has to tell the Philippians this and later appeal to some members of the church to get along with one another is proof that Christian unity does not come without effort or attention. Loving unity is, is as difficult to fulfill as any other part of sanctification. Loving unity. Um, the focus in verse 9 switches to God's role. And we always, and it looks like we are going to study what God is actually doing and how we pray and intercede because God is on control and what is his role in lives, in situations, in political points, in nature, what is going on in nature. God is doing something and we try to understand that. And Jesus humbled himself, but God exalted him. And Jesus' teachings include references to this principle. That when we humble ourselves, God will lift us up. Mark 9 verse 35. And also verse 10. Um, Paul's mention of every knee bowing to God may be a reference also to Isaiah 45. Um, Paul cites the same text in Romans 14 verse 11. Uh, in reference to the day of judgment. Um, both the doomed and the saved saved will make this confession every knee will bow and declare that God is our God and the phrase work out your own salvation so what does that mean work out your own salvation within this obedience that for example we see here now with the Zion taking off his clothes and walking naked for three years to demonstrate something Paul cites the same text like we said and work out your salvation is another way of saying obey, obedience. To work out one's salvation is to apply oneself to living in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. It is a theme of this whole section and the idea of obedience also connects this statement to the previous verses which emphasizes Christ's obedience even to the point of death. So go read Philippians 2 and study it together with Isaiah 20 and what happened there. Now, um, again, Isaiah 20 verse 2, that's our core verse for today, and it reminds us to demonstrate our faith through our actions, that obedience. Um, and Isaiah 20, to 20 verse 2 is interesting, and we think, okay, how are we going to meditate? And pray according to this verse. Well, think about what's happening here. This is something we see in all kinds of different prophets, like I mentioned, um, in the Old Testament. And God calls his prophets, like Isaiah, not just to speak a word, but often to illustrate that word that they're speaking. And to be a demonstration or a model, for example, or in a sense, to be a symbol of what they are saying with their actions. So there should be a relationship between our profession of faith in Christ and our demonstration of what it means to walk in Christ. Again, there should be a relationship between our profession of faith in Christ and our demonstration of what it means to walk in Christ. Now, thankfully, we turn the page to the New Testament and we do not find any command anywhere to lose the sackcloth from our waist. Luckily, because otherwise we're going to jail. Take off our sandals from our feet and walk naked and barefoot. Um, but sometimes we do things that are not what people want, or want to see or want to hear. Um, so that is not a command from scripture we see for us, but still. So at the same time, Isaiah 20 verse 2 and the verses like it pictures and pictures like this 
are a reminder for us. So God was calling Isaiah to do this as a picture of what God was doing among Egypt and Cush, Ethiopia. And God was calling this prophet in his life and in his actions to be a demonstration of his words, a demonstration of his words. And that is reality. And that is a reality that applies to every follower of Christ in the New Testament. That God has called each of us in our lives to be a demonstration of what we are saying. That there should be an authenticity, a relationship between our profession of faith in Christ and our demonstration of what it means to walk with or walk in Christ. So Isaiah 20 verse 2 reminds us our word and action should align. And this verse leads us to pray, to pray that our lives, to, uh, to pray that our lives glorify God. So example prayer like I tried to do lately as well for those who don't know how to pray. We say God teach us to pray. This is not written in stone. It's just to guide. So we pray God help us. God, help every one of us to have a consistency in our lives. God, we pray that what we say and how we live would match. We pray that we would speak the gospel, that we'd, we would glorify you in worship, and at the same time, that our lives would reflect the gospel, that our lives would glorify you in worship. And God, we pray that our lives would be a demonstration of the truth we believe and the truth we proclaim. Help us, we pray, to live in a manner worthy of the gospel. Help us to be salt and light with the gospel so that people see our lives. And that's also part of intercessory pray, prayer. We pray that on others as well. And we want to give glory to you in heaven. God, help us not to be hypocritical in the sense that we say one thing and then our lives reflect something totally different. Help us to be faithful, just as we've seen in this picture of Isaiah being faithful and help us to be faithful to demonstrate what we profess and we pray this in the name of jesus christ amen may your day be blessed be obedient to the word of god listen to what he has to tell you today amen